Welcome, everybody. On behalf of the Friends of Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, this is John Bell. I'll uh, welcome you to the first of the fall lecture series from Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters. Uh, because of the way we're set up, we're going to ask you all to please check to make sure your microphones are muted, because if you talk or your dog barks or anything else happens on your end, uh, it can interrupt the presentation. There will be time at the end for questions, and you may uh, be invited to uh, turn on your mic at that time. Your mic at that time. Uh, this is a uh, or a event organized by the Rangers and staff at the Longfellow House Washington's Headquarters National Historic Site, for which we're very grateful. We at the Friends work with them throughout the year to create events for the public, concerts, poetry readings, lectures like this. And so if you uh, want to see more of those happening, uh, please remember the friends in your charitable giving at the end of this year. And now I will turn over the microphone to Ranger Beth, who is coming to us from the room in the Longfellow House that was Harry Dana's office. Thank you, John. Uh, my name is Beth Wasson. I am the lead park ranger here at the Longfellow House Washington's Headquarters National Historic Site, and I'm really excited to be moderating today's discussion. Uh, just to give you all a heads up, this event is being recorded and will soon be available on our YouTube page. Uh, if you do not wish to be featured in that recording, we do wish, uh, recommend that you turn off your cameras, as we see many of you have done. Uh, live captions are available for this event, and that link is in the chat. Uh, my coworker Emily is uh, very graciously uh, dropping links and uh, uh, helpful things in the chat for you. Uh, and I'm having a little bit of internet connectivity, so if I do disappear at any point, Emily is available to jump in just to uh, keep it going until I'm able to come back. But thank you so much, John, and thank you to the friends of the Longfellow House Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site for their support in funding the 2023 Fall Lecture Series, and to our partners at the American LGBTQ Plus Museum and the History Project. Uh, this is gonna be a really exciting evening. I wanna give you a little heads up as, as to how this is going to go. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce our two incredible speakers, uh, and they'll each give a short presentation about their organizations. Then we'll have a panel conversation. And finally, our panelists are going to take your questions in a Q&A, uh, which we will uh, take questions from the chat. Before I turn it over to our guests, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the very special place that has brought us all together today. Uh, the Longfellow House Washington's Headquarters National Historic Site preserves a remarkable 264-year-old Georgian house whose occupants have shaped our nation. It was a site of colonial enslavement and community activism, George Washington's first long-term headquarters of the American Revolution, and the place where Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote his canon of 19th century American literature. The site's archival collection allows us to trace three generations of queer Longfellows within the home, Samuel Longfellow, Unitarian minister and brother of the famed poet, Alice Longfellow, philanthropist, historic preservationist, and eldest daughter of the poet, and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, or Harry Dana, the professor, activist, and archivist, and grandson of the poet. Their letters, diaries, photos, and other recorded memories preserved in our archive, as well as those of their partners, friends, and families, help us gain insight into the experiences of LGBTQ people throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. Today, uh, the site honors Sam, Alice, and Harry's use of their family home as a historically safe place for queer people by offering LGBTQ plus history tours, hosting special events, including an annual pride picnic in June and an LGBTQ plus history month event, Queer Arts in Parks in October, and continued research and partnerships to expand the stories we tell at the site. We invite you to join us in exploring the queer past and the resonance of these stories today, as together we envision a more inclusive future. Now our site, our, our staff and our site has drawn a lot of inspiration and energy from organizations like the American LGBTQ Plus Museum and the History Project. And it is truly such an honor to be hosting these two outstanding leaders in our field. 
uh, and uh, in our community. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our first speaker. So uh, let me introduce you first, sorry. <laughs> so our first speaker is Ben Garcia. Ben has worked for 20 years to help museums become places of welcome and belonging for all people. He currently serves as the executive director of the American LGBTQ Plus Museum LGBTQ Plus Museum. Ben worked in various roles as an educator and administrator at the J. Paul Getty Museum, Skirball Cult Cultural Center, and Hearst Museum of Anthropology. He then served as deputy director of the Museum of Us and as deputy, deputy executive director and chief learning officer at the Ohio History Connection. Ben graduated from the University of Massachusetts at Boston with a BA in art and the Bank Street College of Education with an MS ed in museum uh, leadership. He has shared his life since 1999 with his husband, Scott, a uh, UX UI designer and comic book artist. And he is a proud fantasy and science fiction nerd. Me too, Ben. Uh, thank you so, so much for being here and I will turn it over to you. Oh, you are still muted, Ben. Perfect. There we go. Good start. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you, John, Beth, Emily, um, all the folks at the Longfellow House for this kind invitation. I'm so happy to be here with you, Joan, um, and excited for the conversation. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I have some slides that will go along with my presentation. So let's see if we can get that working. All right. So, one second. So we have. So, are you all able? Sorry about this. Um, when I put it in slideshow mode, it doesn't let me see my presentation. Um, you know what? I think that I'm going to do this without slides. <clears throat> That'll be the easiest thing. So here we are. Um, I fell in love with museums when I was a young person who lived outside of New York City and would be bussed in for field trips to the American Museum of Natural History and other places. When the day finally came at 14 that I was allowed to go into the city on my own, I took the train to a museum being the nerd that I was. Museums were queer spaces, spaces with dark corners and nude figures and theatrical environments. Museums and New York City were places that as an adolescent, I could imagine one day being myself fully. Joining the American LGBTQ plus museum as executive director uh, almost two years ago, after working in California and Ohio, was a full circle moment that adolescent dream realized. A chance to work with members of this expansive community and with allies to build a museum from the ground up. I think about what this museum will mean to future generations of queer youth coming to New York or finding us online and finding a place where they can be free and fully themselves. At the American LGBTQ Plus Museum, our vision is of a world in which all people work toward and experience the joy of liberation. All people, members of racial and religious minorities, immigrants and refugees, the incarcerated, the impoverished. The late Irva Shivad, a founding board member of the museum and lifelong activist for queer equality, envisioned this museum as a school for activists. Our board chair, Richard Burns, Another longtime leader in the movement called the founding of this museum a political act. We think of ourselves as part of the cultural arm of an activist movement and have worked to seed the museum with those values. 
The American LGBTQ Plus Museum will tell the stories of queer people in the United States from its indigenous beginnings to the present day. Thousands of stories that haven't been told before in museums. Stories brought to life through the work of LGBTQ plus creatives and scholars. We hope it will be a beacon for people around the country and around the world who haven't yet experienced queer liberation. It will be a place of celebration, connection, and hopefully of deep meaning. A liminal space where the connection to our ancestors will be strong. LGBTQ plus people have always been a part of history, yet because of stigma and prejudice, our contributions have often been ignored, erased, or denied. Today, same-sex relationships and gender nonconformity are criminalized in about 70 countries. More than 2 billion people live in countries where the punishment for expressing their identity is imprisonment or death. In the United States and other places where queer people successfully fought for equal rights over the past half century, there are now concerted movements to roll back those recently won protections. Transgender and gender nonconforming people are particularly vulnerable today as political parties in many democracies around the world have made gender identity a wedge issue. To date, despite a progress on a range of LGBTQ plus issues, there are only a handful of queer cultural destinations in the United States and around the world. Furthermore, a num despite a number of excellent rotating exhibitions on queer subjects, there remains a striking absence of queer representation in the ongoing exhibitions at major US museums. The American LGBTQ plus museum will open our first physical home in New York City in a newly built addition to the New York Historical Society on Central Park West. In 2026, the New York Historical Society, New York's first museum founded in 1803, will become home to New York's newest museum, one dedicated to preserving, researching, and sharing American LGBTQ plus history from a queer perspective. Our museum joins the Stonewall National Museum and Archives in Florida, the GLBT Center in San Francisco, and our sister institution in New York, the Leslie Lohman Museum, as well as the more than 200 LGBTQ plus archives and libraries in the United States, many of which, like the History Pro Project, offer public programs and many of which mount exhibitions. Currently, there are more than 11 million Americans who identify as LGBTQ plus. In February 22, a national Gallup poll found that more than 20% of US adults under 25 now identify as queer. Despite the attempt in some quarters to paint queer identity as a Western phenomenon, a coastal phenomenon, an urban phenomenon, the simple fact is that queer people live everywhere and have always lived everywhere. Because we live and have lived in every community, therefore every community has an obligation to document and share our histories. At our groundbreaking, a board member, Amara Jones, an activist and the CEO of Translash Media, address, addressed the gathering and said, the reason we are here is we believe that in times like these, memory can ground us. And we see the consequence of the erasure of memory. Too many people are not here today because they didn't see themselves in the world. No one told them that they had a place. No one told them that they had a history. No one told them that they had a memory. Today, we're joined in hope because an LGBTQ plus museum done in the right way is an act of restoration, an act of hope for people who have yet to be born, people whose names we shall never know, people who will have the opportunity to thrive today because we are giving them the gift of memory. As a startup, we won't squander our opportunity to re-examine the underlying assumptions of museum best practice and authority. We're working to queer the museum form and to set new possibilities for what museums might become. It means that we
We've lost the connection with Ben. We're hoping to get it back shortly. I'm I'm back. Sorry, he cut out he cut out for a second, but yeah, I'm back now. Other Ben, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, this has been the captioner. Sorry, I lost it for a second. I thought I thought it was me. Just making sure. Well, thank you, thank you for being here. We're we're hoping to get Ben Garcia back in order to have for you to have somebody captioned shortly. While we await Ben, oh, sorry, other Ben or captioner Ben. Um, I was curious about who's here tonight in the audience. Like, are you locals? Are you also friends of the Longfellow? I see that Glenn is from DC with the Rainbow History Project. Um, if you feel comfortable using the chat, I would love to learn more about who we're talking to tonight. Faulkner Morgan in Lexington. We did an event with you a couple of years ago or last year. Time is an illusion since COVID. We got some locals. <laughs> and that's not our Lexington here in Massachusetts. That's Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah. Ollie from Fort Collins. Hi, Kevin. Kevin's in Cambridge, I think. Uh, Eileen's in DC. Excellent. Hi, Eileen. Oh, wait. Hi, I think I'm back. <laughs> so sorry about the uh, technical issues. I can uh, Oh. It looks like Beth may be frozen again. <laughs> oh, uh, Badge of Pride, a new queer history organization in Dallas, Texas. Adrian's there. Um, Esau from New York, awesome. Local in Brooklyn, uh, Tomik. Okay, Beth, your video is frozen, but we might still be able to hear you. <laughs> Ben's on his way back in, folks. <laughs> Joan works. <laughs> well. Connect our paths to the ongoing fight for equality for all. She serves on the Massachusetts State Historic Records Advisory Board and the Boston 400th Anniversary Commemoration Committee. She earned her master's degree in public history from UMass Boston and her BA in history and sculpture from the University of Puget Sound. In her spare time, she designs subversive cross-stitch patterns and reads queer romance novels with her wife and cats. You can check out her work at ilaquajone.com. Uh, Sorry. And Joan, that's your cue. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it looks like Beth may be frozen. Um, so thank you all so much for having me here. I'm going to share my screen. I have a couple of photos um, or a short presentation that has some photos from our archives. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Longfellow, and thank you, friends of Longfellow, for having me and Ben here tonight. It's really uh, my first internship in the museum world was with the National Park Service, and I have a very deep affection for the work that you do uh, across the country. So uh, I can pretend to be a ranger this evening. Uh, as Beth mentioned in my intro, I'm Joan Alacqua. I'm the executive director of the History Project. I'm coming here tonight from my house in Waltham, Massachusetts, uh, although the History Project's office is in downtown Boston, we're in Copley Square. Uh, and I wanted to share a bit about the work that we do on a local level to document, preserve, and share queer history. And, oh, here we go. Moving the chat over so I can keep an eye on things while I talk. And yeah, these are all buttons from the collection. Some are newer, some are uh, vintage. 
But yeah, so the History Project, we have been around since 1980. These are uh, photos of our first flyer on the left there. On the right is uh, a picture of some of our members in Pride in the 1980s. Uh, and we came together in 1980, uh, a group of activists, archivists, and historians who wanted to find examples of queer people throughout history. As Ben was saying, queer people have always been here. Uh, I like to say in Massachusetts, since before the pilgrims landed, there have been queer people in this area. And so that group came together. They got a very small amount of money from the city of Boston. They did research, they put together a slideshow and they started showing it at bars and colleges. And over time we've begun to, or we've continued to collect the records of LGBTQ plus people, uh, of the movement, uh, of organizations and of individuals uh, here in Boston and Massachusetts statewide. We have some materials from across New England. Um, and when we started, we were the only one up here doing this work, but now there are so many other queer community archives and organizations. It's just really amazing uh, to be part of that movement across the country. Um, some of what we have these are the buttons again. We have a lot of ephemera in our collection. Um, compared to maybe a typical archives, uh, we also bring in bar matchbooks and glasses and windows and drag queen dresses and hats from the Hat Sister and all of these other kind of ephemeral objects that also tell the story of our community. So if you'd like to visit us, um, I was going to put in the chat a couple of links. Um, like I said, our office is in, uh, nope, that's Emmy Howe's name. I Googled you, uh, here you go. YouTube, um, the History Project, my own website uh, to check out some of the collections that we have in the archives. Uh, and some of those have been digitized. And so, I have a few collection highlights I wanted to show uh, to talk a little bit about what has happened here on a Boston local level, um, but also to show off some things that uh, are not typically taught as part of the mainstream of uh, history education in Massachusetts, something that I'm hoping to change. These are photos from the first Pride March here in Boston. They were taken by John Kuiper, who's a local activist. Uh, and photographer and writer and volunteer at the History Project. Uh, that first pride that took place two years after the Stonewall riots uh, was not sanctioned by the city, was completely grassroots, and uh, involved lists of demands that the speakers read at four different distinct sites uh, on a march route. Um, they demanded things like safety inside and outside of bars. They demanded things like uh, for the police to stop harassing them inside and outside of bars. Uh, Massachusetts had a, a law in the books um, against lewd and lascivious conduct, which can mean whatever you want it to mean. So that could be anything from loitering to meeting someone in the fens after dark. Uh, they stopped at the state house and spoke out against uh, anti-sodomy laws that had been on the books since the 1600s. And they stopped at a church and talked about how queer people should have the right to participate in church to uh, even get married. And finally, they had a ceremonial closet smashing on Boston Common at the Parkman bandstand. So the thing is, though, our LGBTQ plus history doesn't start in the, the 60s. Like I said, queer people have always been here. Um, they've always been part of our community and as Ben said, of every community. And so I wanted to highlight some of the earliest uh, documents within our collection. So the, the history stories that we tell go all the way back to 400 plus years here in New England. Um, but this is one of the oldest collections we have documented. It's the George Chapin Scott and Eddie F. Bernier collection. Um, these are photos from the 1950s. Uh, Eddie was, uh, Eddie's the guy all the way on the right in the, um, with the towel on his head. We have lots of photos of Eddie in kind of, I think what we would now call quick drag uh, and a few videos as well. But the two of them were partners. Eddie was a hairdresser. Um, and unfortunately he passed away in a car accident on the Cape uh, in the, in I think the early 1960s. Um, 
George, about 40 years later, began uh, donating parts of his records to the archives. Um, and when he died a few years after that, uh, his landlord or his family threw everything else out. And so these photos that you see here actually were in the trash. Um, a neighbor picked them up and brought them to us. And so um, they're now safe in the archives. But I think the the kind of point I want to make with this story is just um, there are so many stories and people whose stories we don't know, who whose stories we will never know, people who didn't have the opportunity to tell their own story in their own words or be out at any particular point in time. Um, a lot of the people, at least I find in my historical research, tend to be either those who are documented, those who are arrested or end up in, usually arrested, uh, but end up in newspapers or in medical records um, who aren't telling their own story, who are being written about. Uh, and people with privilege who had the opportunity in their lifetime to be uh, out and in whatever ways that they could. I think there are some stories like that uh, associated with the Longfellow house. Although Henry Dana, I think has like a, a tragic, he gets thrown out of the house and there's a whole lavender scare thing. Um, if you wanna learn more about those, we've done a couple events with Longfellow up on our YouTube page, which is what I linked there. So, but to get back on topic, stories like this are what keep me doing this work. Um, I think it's really important for us as queer people to have the opportunity to one, learn our history, um, to know that we are part of a culture and community that is deep and rich and long and diverse and um, full of sometimes tragedy, but also so much joy. Um, and I also think that we as queer people have the should have the opportunity to be able to tell our own story in our own words, um, to be able to document ourselves. And uh, so the History Project continues to do that work today. We bring in collections from uh, local organizations and activists. Uh, these are Daughters of Belitis newsletters. So those are from the 60s and 70s. But um, I wanted to show... Gay Community News. Um, we have, you know, documents like this, uh, the Robert John Quinn Memorial books. Um, Robert John Quinn was a man who uh, had AIDS and throughout the 1990s, um, knowing that he was positive, started creating scrapbooks of obituaries of gay people, um, some who he knew, some who he didn't know, some who were, you know, kind of nationally famous. Um, and we got a grant a few years ago to digitize all of these. Um, there's 28 scrapbooks in total. And some of these scrapbooks have some of the only information I can find about some of the people within them. And um, they're an amazing resource, but I wanna make sure that, you know, 20 years from now, people trying to do this research, people trying to connect with their history have the opportunity to do that. And so this was the slide I wanted to show you. These are photos from 2020. They're from the Trans Resistance March, the first one that took place in 2020. Um, they were donated by Joe Trujillo, who was then part of Boston Pop-Up Pride and Boston Pride for the People. Um, and photos like this, I think, are really important in a historical organization. Um, it's very recent history, but it shows who we are as a community, what we are out there doing. Um, and explains why we're doing it. I think uh, the History Project uniquely as a historical organization here in Boston is part of this community. And um, because of that, because we're embedded in it, I, at least for me, try really hard to make sure that uh, we are connecting with and working with all of the organizations on the ground, working to make sure that we uh, change laws, that we, uh, stop banning books. Right now, there's a, a book, uh, a ban, or, or an attempt to ban book bans in the Massachusetts State Senate. Um, you know, the people who are trying to include LGBTQ plus history in curricula. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it's really, it's my pleasure that I get to do this work. And I've been trying to keep an eye on time. I have no idea if I've gone over or under. Um, but I'd really love to get to the questions. This is a photo from Pride 2016 of the History Project. Um, 
if you want to learn more about us, I really do encourage you to check out our website. If you email us at info at historyproject.org, eventually it gets to our uh, one of our two staff people, either I or Sam Valentine, our director of archives and outreach. Um, and if you're here in Boston, please look us up. Or if you'd like to come look at the archives, anyone can come in. You have to make an appointment because there's only two of us. But um, anyone can come in for any reason. You don't have to be a historian. You don't have to have an ID. Um, we're here for you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. That was incredible. So excited about your work. I do. I also would like uh, to offer or to invite Ben, if you would like to finish your remarks, uh, we can jump back to you for a few minutes if you'd like. Um, sure. Sorry about that, everyone. The Wi-Fi in our office went out. Um, I will just let me. I, I feel like Joan. Like it'll be great to get to the conversation. Um, I'll just tell you a couple of things about sort of the uh, what we're planning. Um, we basically are planning on four platforms for engaging queer history and culture. Um, instead of working to sort of build a monolithic uh, institution, a large building, um, we really are envisioning more of a distributed model for impact. So we will have our home base in New York at the New York Historical Society in, their, in a new wing that they're building. Um, that will be 5,000 square feet of gallery space dedicated to a core exhibition. And we'll partner with them on rotating exhibitions as well. We are also going to create a set of traveling exhibitions in partnership with museums around the country. Um, small panel exhibitions that will go to LGBTQ community centers um, and mid-sized and larger exhibitions that will be geared at museums. Our strategy is really to sort of show up in history organizations and museums in purple counties um, in red states and around the country so that, you know, uh, queer people living in any part of the United States will be within a few hours drive of, of one of the exhibitions that um, our partners and we um, put on together. Um, the third piece is a digital, a set of digital experiences, born digital experiences, gamified experiences um, to meet people um, who can't come to physical uh, exhibitions. And then finally, the fourth is something that we've already started over the past two years, um, public programs that we do um, around the country in New York, hybrid, uh, virtual, and in-person. So um, that's the model. We've already rolled out the programmatic piece. We're uh, launching our first traveling exhibition on Monday at the center here in New York. We'll travel to five cities um, from there called Queer Justice on 50 years of uh, LGBTQ um, activism and liberation through the courts, through uh, legal victories. And that's in partnership with Lambda Legal, um, a major LGBTQ legal advocacy organization. Um, we've also made an important decision around collections. We've decided not to be a collecting institution as we talked to people uh, in positions like Jones around the country, in queer archives around the country, we heard very clearly that what was not needed was an additional new archive and collecting facility, but rather support for the existing network of collecting entities and archives. And so um, we are planning to uh, use our platform and our resources to support the health of the existing ecosystem of archives. Um, we will borrow for exhibitions, pay loan fees, conserve and digitize artifacts that will be on view in, ex in our exhibitions, um, and then return those to their homes. And hopefully that will be something that is a win-win both for the archives and collections that exist around the country and for our program. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, those are sort of some of the broad strokes. We are uh, excited to really be engaging people in lots of different ways, um, joining the work of uh, the History Project and other folks. Um, because in this moment, all of our museums, archives, parks, historic sites, need to do the work of equipping visitors for a life where the fight for our liberation is a daily one. Um, and to mix together that inspiration and knowledge of the past, connection with our ancestors, 
um, and ideas for how to step into uh, an activist place, how to support people who are struggling um, so that we can all benefit from the beauty and power of queer perspectives and creativity, queer resilience, and of course, queer magic. So really excited to get into conversation um, and uh, just appreciate the, the time to talk to y'all. Thank you so much. Uh, wow, just like so important and exciting the work both of you are doing. And I'm, we're so, you know, so lucky to have you uh, here. Let's get right into it. Uh, our first question for the both of you is about uh, each other's work. Uh, how do you see the impact of each other's organizations across the wider field? Well, we, when did we meet Ben? Was it last year? It may have only yeah. been last year. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's really, I think for us at least, you know, we're looking at the, the queer movement in the community on a more local level. A lot of the time, I think the story is told through what's happening at the the state level. There are times when the community comes together and marches on Washington or when uh, Oberavel v. Hodge, uh, you know, makes it so that we can get married around the country. There are these big moments, but there are a lot of small moments too. And so, um, yeah, that was a part of, we of what we talked about. It's like, well, if all these groups are already doing it, what are you doing? And you were very nice to me, even though I was like, huh, who are you? Um, and it's just been, it's been really exciting actually to see the programming that's coming out of the American LGBTQ plus, um, museum and the, the signal boosting too. their email list picks up on what all of us smaller organizations are doing around the country. And I think is, um, bridging some connections or, or creating some connections that, that weren't already, be, already there, um, for small organizations like our, mine, ours, uh, we, you know, we have small budgets, uh, like my organization, we don't own our building, we rent, we don't have an exhibit space, we fundraise every year for our whole uh, budget. And being able to partner with a bigger organization that is willing to partner with us and not just show up and be like, give us the good stuff and see you later is is a really important thing. And And I appreciate that about the work that Ben and everyone at the American LGBTQ Plus Museum is doing. Um, that's lovely. Thank you, Joan. I mean, I feel like, you know, as you, for us to sort of enter this landscape of queer history and um, really sort of think about why is it, why do we need another organization that's looking at this? Um, I think we're very interested in making sure we sort of understand the ways in which um, we can use the platform and the resources that we're able to attract as an organization that's really aimed very directly on sort of experiences and exhibitions that's really sort of looking at sort of being a part of that sort of museum educational informal learning ecosystem you know, uh, one of our colleagues, Nina Simon, <clears throat> who wrote a book called The Participatory Museum, talks about how museums need to be space makers for uh, what you know, the full quote is space makers for risk takers. Um, but really, that idea of museums as space makers, um, you know, what we see is um, organizations like the History Project that are doing incredible work, really important work in preserving. Um, the archives and, and uh, artifacts that uh, document our history. And that is such a huge responsibility and obligation. And, you know, collections are the forever business. Um, we all know that. And so if what we can do is, you know, support their ability to amplify their message and the meaning of their histories and their collections, um, you know, we want to be able to do that. And I think, you know, the History Project is just one point of light across the full canvas of this of the country. And these, you know, these archives are amazing and the resources that they're stewarding are incredible. 
And um, so for us, we just hope that we can find really authentic partnerships and ways that we help them with their ongoing stewardship and sustainability um, while not sort of trying to suck up resources that would otherwise go to them, right? So we're very sort of aware of that um, and just trying to design our program to keep local money local, local history uh, held locally. But we also recognize that we, most of us, none of us grew up going to our local museums and seeing our lives reflected. And so we wanna be a part of uh, helping museums do a better job with that. And so hopefully this intermediary kind of role, this space making role um, will, will be a good approach for that. Can I jump back in? Or I'm gonna jump back in. Um, something you said earlier, Ben, about creating exhibits and going to places where there is isn't representation is super important. I think there's um I don't know how many folks in the audience are like museum people or or you know library and archives people, but there's that fallacy of neutrality. That idea of like as archivists or historians, we're just we're looking at the past and we're finding the truth of what happened and showing it to people. Um and I think our work gets called political a lot of the time. Um, and I don't think it's particularly political to ensure that everyone has, well, maybe it is, um, you know, has rights that we're telling stories from many different backgrounds that we're connecting people and talking about people who haven't been on the main stage. Um, and to be able to have an organization that is going out there and deliberately doing that um, is still kind of a political act and is a really amazing and important thing to do. Um, so yeah, so that's what I wanted to say. I just, that hit me as like a, you know, snaps kind of moment. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah, I mean, I do think that um, what we're hoping is that we will be able to structure this so that we work with museums to create exhibitions of sort of national relevance that they can travel to museums around the country and that we will be able to offer those at no cost with the um, requirement that that museum work with local queer archives and queer advocacy organizations um, to build out some of the local story that connects to that larger idea. And so, again, that idea of trying to get those cultural organizations to invest in the, re the relationships with their local queer organizations. Um, and then, you know, all of that, you know, all of the sort of content that's developed through those you know, through those uh, exercises can then become part of a larger shared repository of um, educational resources, digital resources and the like. So um, it really, you know, you know, I think that um, if this works well, it will do sort of exactly what you're envisioning, Joe. Thank you both. And um, I got to say, I've already had like three or four, maybe five snaps moments. So I'm so excited to rewatch this recording already. Um, while we're talking about work that inspires us, do you have any, is there anyone out there or any institutions um, that are already doing the work that excites you um, uh, uh, who influence the work that you're doing at your sites, your organizations? Hmm. I'm like, I don't know who influenced us, but uh, I think on a, on a local level here in Boston, in the last 10 years, a lot of places are doing a much better job of telling any queer stories as part of their interpretation. Um, I think Longfellow is one example of that. We've done a lot of partnerships with you and it's been, all of them have been very lovely. It's a, a great example of you know, uh, another organization reaching out to community organizations and highlighting what we're doing, but also sharing 
the pretty amazing queer stories that you have at Longfellow House. Um, but like the Gibson House Museum that talks about Charlie Gibson, who founded the museum, who was a queer man, um, who wasn't, they didn't talk about his sexuality or personal life um, until about 10 years ago, I, I think is when they first started to. I mean, he's highlighted the History Project put out a book in 1998 and there's there's a whole page on Charlie Gibson and his his queerness around town and his, you know, walking around in silk pajamas with a fur coat in the back bay um, sort of stories. Um, but, you know, their, their board and the family who were involved and whoever else was there wasn't ready. And um, that's changed. Historic New England has also done really amazing work. Um, I'd like to call it in particular Ken Torino, uh, who has done a lot of work about talking about queer lives in historic house museums. Um, and, you know, they have the Sarah Orne Jewett house. Uh, she was in a Boston marriage with Annie Fields. That's up in uh, Maine. And the uh, Sleeper McCann house, um, Beauport, which is in Gloucester, which if you ever get the chance, they don't do tours all the time. It's amazing. Um, Henry Sleeper was the first, America's first interior designer. Every room is themed differently. There are tiny little busts of George Washington all over the place because he had a thing for him. It's just like, and and they talk about, you know, his relationship with his neighbors, some of whom were also uh, queer people who he had visiting, who were, were visiting his neighbors, which uh, artists and Boston Bohemians were there. So um, yeah, just, just on a local scale. And I was gonna say, Ben, you talked about Nina Simon. Margaret Middleton is also doing really amazing museum work about queer possibility in, uh, collections and in uh, really an interpretation because sometimes we are we're reading between the lines we're looking at like how are people crossing the norms of sexuality in their time how are they transing gender norms during their time um, and that's amazing work and then finally the digital transgender archive which we should put a link up to um, KJ Rawson and his team of like undergrads uh, scanning materials from around the world to add to one repository to highlight trans history that has not always been visible um, is just really amazing and inspiring. Yeah. Um, I uh, was just grabbing the, there you go. Someone did it perfectly. I'm here faster than any. Um, yeah, I think those are some really great uh, examples. I mean, I do think about, as we think about sort of what are the museums that are informing our thinking as we develop both the physical experience and some of the traveling exhibitions, um, you know, I think about places like uh, the Legacy Museum uh, in Montgomery. Uh, there's a museum actually uh, called the Museum of the Dutch Resistance in the Netherlands and Amsterdam that just reorganized itself. And I went and visited and what I saw there, I mean, I guess what I saw at the Legacy Museum was a very thoughtful way to bring people along a historical narrative that would not be familiar to many people who go in there. Um, and they did it very compellingly, meeting people sort of at their imagination, their emotion, and sort of just educating them sort of through this like 3D um, experience and, and finding ways to tell a story for which there are not a lot of artifacts, um, to sort of have artifacts that are so meaningful, like the the, the jars of earth from, lynch, from sites of um, racial lynching um, that are all lined up in this room. So I think they do an incredible job with storytelling around a very complicated and contested uh, history. And they're pushing against the sort of dominant narrative in ways that are really, really smart and very and very um, powerful. The Museum of the Dutch Resistance found a way to also tell a really big, nuanced, complicated story within a very small footprint by focusing on um, sort of the universal and the specific, focusing on sort of individuals and letting them sort of stand for larger groups of people who experience similar things. 
they also were able to bring a lot of nuance to a narrative that had been very sort of, you know, the the Dutch people resisted the Nazis and were all heroes. They were really able to sort of bring some nuance to that and talk about um, the fact that many many people in the Netherlands didn't resist the Nazis until the Nazi regime started um, conscripting, forcibly conscripting um, all Dutch men between you know a certain age to go work in labor in labor camps, and that really activated um, the resistance. And you know, and also to sort of talk about the ways in which. Um, countries that had been colonized or invaded by the Dutch, um, how the people living there, the indigenous people in those countries, or the descendants of enslaved people in those countries, um, sort of responded to seeing the colonizer of their country now colonized or occupied. And sort of, they were just able to bring such, they were able to do in a, in a small space, such deep and nuanced storytelling. So those are two sort of physical museums that are, doing things that, you know, that, that we think that, you know, that really inspired me as I think about how we tell such a broad and sort of deep story, you know, in a core exhibition that will potentially be 5,000 square feet, right? So, um, so those are just two that come to mind. Awesome, thank you. And it leads us right into our next question. I'm wondering how you think preserving and sharing queer history um, helps us to understand where we are today and uh, where we might be going, how we can envision our future together. I can start. I have a hard time with silences on Zoom. I am just acknowledging that. Um, I think one thing that sticks out to me, and I keep saying kind of in this political moment, but in this, you know, we're there is a backlash right now to all of the progress made um, in the last decade uh, or more. And I think one thing that I've been thinking about recently uh, is that one of the first queer book bands was in Boston. Um, it was Leaves of Grass uh, by Walt Whitman, which is probably not surprising. Um, but it was a group called the New England, New England Society for the Preservation of Vice, I think, um, or something like, they eventually become called the Watch and Word Society. Um, and, you know, Whitman's answer to them saying, you know, you should take this book off the shelves and edit it and take out all this obscenity uh, was to write another edition and keep publishing. Um, and so, that's just, that's like one kind of maybe archaic example, but that there are so many people who made us, got us to this moment now in, in Massachusetts, you know, the people who got the initial, what we called the, the gay bill of rights, the initial bill to uh, basically make it illegal to discriminate against people on the basis of sexuality and, um, housing, employment, and public accommodations, that only happened in 1989. Um, I was born in 1988. So like, it's in my lifetime. The people who did that work are still working on Beacon Hill to get laws passed to ensure that we, you know, are updating our, you know, uh, health curriculum to include queer people. Like that's something that's happening in Massachusetts right now. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I think that there's a lot that we can learn from these stories and from these archives to help us continue the fight today. Um, and I think that sometimes that history is not as far behind us as we might think it is. So yeah, those are kind of my musings on that at least. Yeah, I love that example, Janet. I mean, I'm, I think sort of in the same way, I think what history does is so first of all, if we pay attention to it, it will provide us with some strategies that will be effective as we look at this current moment. Um, you know, I think about sort of the decolonize the museum protests that were happening at the American Museum of Natural History, um, you know, a couple of years ago. And today I learned about, um, the Lesbian Feminist Liberation Group that in 1973 
like paraded with a paper mache lavender dinosaur to the American Museum of Natural History, mm -hmm. and picketed in front of the statue of Theodore Roosevelt mm -hmm. with a very similar yeah, thing. I and so I think it's, you know, I think I find it, you know, I, this idea that, um, you know, not sort of knowing that the fights that we're engaged in today are the fights that people have been engaged in in some way in every generation is a real loss. And I think for those of us who are living close to history um, or with an awareness of history, you know, you do, of course, con constantly confront this idea that that all of this is cyclical, that, you know, we are sort of sort of spiraling and hopefully like each turn around, um, you know, things are 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 a little bit better or you know i mean i guess you just stop being surprised but i think that understanding that the fights we're fighting today were fought and sometimes lost and sometimes won you know 20 years ago 40 years ago 60 years i like just with regularity i think to some people can feel discouraging but i guess for me just helps us feel like you know we understand that we have to brush our teeth every day if we want to have healthy teeth for our whole life. You know, we understand we have to take care of ourselves every single day. And it's sort of the same thing with activism and the work around um, supporting the freedoms of humans or pushing against fascism. That is not something you can just do for a concerted moment and then stop for 10 more years, you know, without there being repercussions. That's work we have to do every single day. There were a number of queer organizations that after marriage equality just sort of dissolved themselves as if problem solved. And um, so, yeah, so I think that relationship with history, understanding queer history just helps us understand that this is a daily practice. And like any, you know, that the only way we're going to um, continue to remain healthy is by is by understanding that you have to do a bit of it every day. Thank you. And I have, uh, I'd like to know, um, you know, what you're most excited about in the field right now, but we're kind of uh, leaning right towards uh, one of my other questions, which is what is the biggest challenge we're facing uh, in the field of queer history right now? Uh, so we'll start with the challenge and we'll end with uh, what's exciting. Um, I, I, go, ahead, go ahead, go. Yeah. I was like trying to take the pressure off you for a change. Um, uh, I would say that a challenge that I am recognizing daily is a generational divide um, in the community. Um, and as we sort of think about queer history, and this is not just queer history, I think this is all history interpretation, this sort of whose history. Um, I think that, gosh, there's, you know, there's sort of two pieces of this. One, you know, one part of this is as we work to tell histories that were not centered in even our own internal queer history narratives, um, which means histories of uh, BIPOC queer people and trans and gender um, queer people, we are seeing the same kind of sort of negative response, fragility, um, fear, from effectively white cis uh, queer uh, queer people about sort of what telling those histories means to the histories that they were used to hearing about or that they were comforted by or that they participated in. And so I think the challenge is how do we in part help people understand that this is in, large part an additive process, not a subtractive one, but that also, like any community, um, we have to, you know, we have to look at this, 
the misogyny and the white supremacy that we were all affected by um, as, you know, even within sort of our queer spaces, right? And that those queer spaces weren't safe for everyone and the movement um, didn't prioritize uh, people of color and uh, gender queer or trans people. Um, so finding a way to have that conversation, to move, to bring nuance into that conversation, to sort of keep people in space together um, to engage around that at a time where we are all getting very used to sort of throwing bombs and walking out um, is probably the biggest challenge for like all history, all learning, all community, right? And so I think I'm just seeing that. I'm seeing that in queer history. Um, and I'm seeing, you know, there are a couple of, you know, I think um, even the term queer is really contentious, you know, in, a, across a social generational line. I feel like I came out in the late 80s and we're queer, we're here, get used to it was a very empowering idea for me. And so, you know, but I do feel like there are people for whom that term feels very triggering and very harming. And they often don't feel like there is a willingness to really hear that or listen from rising generations. And then I think there are people in rising generations for whom that term feels really empowering because you don't have to subscribe to just sort of one letter in the alphabet. Um, we, you know, I think the comfort with fluidity across the board is so much greater in rising generations than it is in sort of my generation, Gen X and older. And so that is also another tension that I'm seeing is like how people, how do we stop like the binary? How do we stop the sort of taxonomical way of thinking about things and get comfortable with, with fluidity just across the board? I think Gen Z is really amazing about that. And like there, I have met in this work so many young people who um, just one, have access, I think, to <laughs> more resources than, than we did growing up. Like I had some of the internet, but not what's out there now. Um, I didn't have Tumblr. Uh, and their willingness, I think, to talk about that fluidity and talk about what's changing and also kind of accept people for where they are and whoever they are is just like super inspiring um and uh, yeah they're really amazing um I was thinking about in terms of challenges um one is is again that political side of of telling history I think there's maybe we've always been in this moment but this idea that like you were saying, Ben, talking about diverse histories, whether that is of people of color or indigenous people or queer people or trans people is somehow taking away from um, other narratives that have been the mainstream narratives of history. Um, the example I was gonna share, and I pulled up an article is that uh, Southern Invisible Histories, which is a queer community archive across several Southern states, uh, did a pride talk at the Alabama State Archives and um, bills were submitted to take away funding from the archives for them having a woke political talk. And they were talking about queer and trans people from Alabama, from their, you know, from their state who, who were part of it and were trying to deny that these people even existed or that talking about these people um, had, you know, a political agenda that was, uh, <laughs> They, they should take five million dollars away from the archives over and like um it's wild it's hard it's uh you know I don't even know how to describe it I think um there's at least maybe in a way that I hadn't thought about before there's a fear of backlash for talking about any of this. And like, I'm out and proud. Like, I think, I don't know if it's my website or where I started calling myself a professional lesbian to piss off my parents. And like, it's out there, it's not going back into the closet. Um, and 
Yeah, I, I think that pushing past that kind of like, well, what if somebody says something? What if something happens? It's like, well, we're here. We're here. We've always been here. We're always going to be here and you can't stop us um, is what I've started thinking about. Um, something you said earlier, Ben, about, you know, you can't do the work and then take a break for 10 years. Um, we did an event this past summer about, it was about queer politics. So, so Massachusetts, we have Maura Healy. She is our first openly, I mean, I think she's the first openly lesbian governor. Um, although someone, I think Oregon's governor also, you know, won at the same time, but we're in the East coast time zone. So Maura Healy is the first. And, um, so we had a conversation about, you know, queer political history, queer political activism. Um, and in planning that, I made sure that we had a second panel about what's going on right now and, you know, who's out there doing the work. Um, what are they concerned with? You know, organizations on a local level like Mass Equality, the Mass Trans Political Coalition are just like, they're out there and they're doing it. And it's really amazing. Um, but at the first event, Byron Rushing was there talking about marriage equality. He was um, a representative. He's a, a judge. He's a leader in Boston's Black community. And he said, you know, when you win, the people you win against don't stop just because you won. They keep on going. And so you have to, too, um, and celebrate the victories, but keep on working. So that's where I am with queer history right now. That was more introspective than I expected. It was fantastic. Thank you. And I can't do uh, the challenges without uh, ending with some joy. So before we get to our last question, can you just share a little bit of joy? Uh, what What are you seeing in the field that's bringing you joy? I will say that what brings me joy uh, is the way that rising generations are engaging um, with queer history. Um, I think that you know, my colleagues bring me joy, you know, every day. They are unbelievable. They're, the clarity of their vision, the clarity of their desire for this to really be, be transformational history, to move from sort of inclusion to equity to, you know, um, with restoration to true transformation. And um, they just inspire me so much. I mean, uh, I just feel like there is going to be such power in these historical narratives um, as they get sort of navigated by rising generations who have just such great critical faculty and such great um, sort of bullshit detectors around inauthenticity. So I don't know. I think I feel I feel very, very inspired by and hopeful for. And honestly, I think that um, you know, we're at a moment where there is a generation of activists who were active during the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, who are um you know, sort of thinking about legacy and end of life and, you know, who are going to be, you know, passing on. And um, I think that for them to see organizations like Jones and like the one we're starting, um, to for them to know that their work will carry on and will be preserved um, is another is another thing that I, you know, I see people feel the impact of understanding that what they did in the 80s during the AIDS epidemic and crisis will not only matter then, but matters so much now and will be preserved and continue to be told. Um, and so that always just is incredible. Yeah, I think um, the... Something I love about this work is, is that you can have some of these intergenerational conversations where um, there are young people who ask questions at events that we put on um, that no one 
thought to ask because, you know, they're thinking about something that they did 50 years ago. We've been doing a series on gay community news. Um, the American LGBTQ plus museum sponsored our first one. Uh, and having folks in the room talk about the type of work that they were doing and also thinking about how that may affect what's happening now has been a joy to perceive, to be part of, to be part of that community. Um, last night, someone was talking about outing historical figures and um, he asked if the policy had, if the paper had an out policy about, you know, who they would write about and who they wouldn't, if somebody was in the closet, would they not write about them? And these folks just kind of were like, huh, we haven't thought, I don't think we had a policy, but you know, this is how we did it. And being able to, I don't know, have that kind of, those kinds of conversations where it's like, well, now this is how we would do, do things. How did you do it then? How can we learn from each other is really important. Um, the other thing that comes to mind, and this also bounces off, I think what you were saying, Ben, about um, as queer organizations, we have to be very intentional to be intersectional. And again, the term intersectionality is not that old, um, but you know, places like the History Project, we've been doing really intentional work to make sure that we're connecting with, in particular, Boston's communities, queer communities of color, um, to make sure that we are documenting the stories of people who are out there doing the work now, that we are highlighting the stories of people who haven't been um, foregrounded even in queer narratives. Uh, and that work just, just needs to continue. Um, and yeah, it's really, really uh, gratifying work, I think, to be able to do that and to be able to um, make that difference there because, you know, queer history isn't just about white guys in P-Town. I love them, but it's not just them. Incredible, thank you. Uh, and I am always here for some more joy. Glenn, if you would love to come, uh, come off mute. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Greetings from DC, where the temperature just dropped about 30 degrees over the last hour. Um, as, as I noted in the, the notes, I am the board chair for Rainbow History Project. We're in our 23rd year. We do very, very similar to work what Joan and History Project in Boston are doing. The original founders of the organization created a program called community pioneers 20 years ago. And over the course of time and in a regular schedule, we would nominate and then celebrate and recognize individuals and organizations that contributed to the success and safety and future of the LGBTQ community here in the greater DC slash DMV area. For LGBTQ History Month this year, we realized some of them had never met each other. I've hardly met any of them. And so we planned and produced a family reunion and invited everyone who still lives in the area or who's still with us or a family member or a partner to get together. And we had 23 of our almost 90 pioneers together for an afternoon of, of recognition and celebration. And I'm getting emotional thinking about it, but it was a really incredible way to reach back and, and tell a lot, not a lot, but our younger volunteers and, and, and activists, these are literally the shoulders and these are the giants that we stand on. Every person in this room made it possible for us to be who we are today. And on top of that, it was in a new event space that used to be the clinic waiting room for Whitman Walker back in the day. So they've transformed that and made it into something. So there was a lot of celebration and there was a lot of recognition. So that is my queer joy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing that. My pleasure. Wonderful. Uh, I have one last question, but I just want to uh, give a shout uh, out to everyone in our audience today. Um, if you would like to uh, bring up a question for Joan or Ben, please just drop that in the chat. We do have a couple already queued up, um, but please uh, drop that in the chat and we'll 
uh, get to those in just a moment. Uh, my last question for you, uh, you've already kind of touched on a tiny bit, uh, but what recommendations do you have for people who want to start learning about or preserving LGBTQ plus history in their own lives or in their own communities? Uh, I mean, if you want to learn about your own community, go figure out who your queer community archive is. There are so... 200 plus, is that what the number we're going with? 200 plus queer libraries and, and archives um, and communities there, what, 300 some odd community centers around the country? Like there, there's a lot out there. <clears throat> so go find them and see what they suggest to read um, or just, you know, go find some, some, in my case, this is how I got into this work with the history project, find some elder lesbians who will start telling you stories and then you get hooked. And then here you are 10 years later giving a talk about queer history in museums. Um, so that that's one thing I was thinking, uh, if you wanna document your own history, I think one of the most accessible ways is actually through oral history. Um, the Especially now with how cell phones are, the tools are not that expensive. There are tons of free guides online. I did a, a training for the Boston Public Library last year that's on YouTube. Um, and, you know, find some folks to to talk to or, or talk to your friends, because that's the sort of stuff we can't find later on is like, you know, what nightclub were you going to? I don't remember. Where was I? I don't know, you know, 20 years from now. So those are my suggestions. I love that suggestion, Jim. There's nothing that an archivist or historian likes better than like uncovering some really good shit talking from like back in the day. <laughs> So do some of that and record it. Seriously, people in the future will really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have more to add. I think it really is, you know, most of these, all of these organizations, most of these organizations, they need hands, they need help. Um, and so if you spend a couple hours there a month and you can just immerse yourself in in all the things and the stuff, then, um, you know, I think it's going to come to you. So. Yeah. Incredible. Thank you. I'll just say one of my favorite uh, historical stories here is uh, the story of Harry Dana, um, not just working to preserve uh, the stories of queer people around him, but preserving his own queer history. It really speaks to what you were saying about uh, remembering that our stories are important too. Um, and thank you for, for, for sharing that. Um, we're going to jump over to the Q&A. We have a couple of already great questions. Um, our first is from Kate, a uh, very, very good friend of the Longfellow House. Uh, Kate wants to know if you are, either of you, are planning any programming with our very good friends over at Stonewall National Monument. Yeah, so I met with... Um... Dana Rodriguez, we've done uh, a, to sort of talk a little bit about the possibilities. We are, we're so glad that that um, visitor center is getting uh, started up. It seems like it's going to be an amazing space again, doing so much with such a small footprint. Um, so yes, we will be working closely with them, looking at what the partnerships are. We've already done, um, I think, a couple of things, you know, with them. And um, again, we think, I mean, as I think about sort of a network, you know, if we think about New York City as a network of organizations that are doing this, an amazing site-based, you know, history organization here, the LGBTQ Historic Sites Network and um, Stonewall and Leslie Lohman and we, and then, you know, uh, uh, and then, you know, LaGuardia Wagner, uh, in Queens does exhibitions. And I mean, there's just, uh, it's really, it's wonderful. So yeah, we're gonna be, we're really looking forward to working with them and we're so excited. Um, their opening will happen, you know, a year or two before ours. And we're just so excited to go and celebrate that. We haven't planned anything with Stonewall, but in a local NPS sense, National Park Service sense, um, I already, complimented everything that Longfellow is doing, which is really amazing. Um, an audio tour just went up that Ranger Macy Mark made. 
um, of Beacon Hill that you can take on your phone. That is a queer Beacon Hill uh, self-guided tour. Um, who else? I'm, I don't want to name names because I'm going to forget names of people, but there's just, there's been a lot of, I think, willingness with the Park Service here to, to engage with um, the queer history that is here. And maybe that's because the Park Service has always been a little queer, but um, it's it's been really wonderful. So go. I'll find the link to that tour. Yeah, that tour also featured uh, several Longfellow House Rangers, including Ranger Kate. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for, for all you do, Kate, and for that question. Uh, we have a question from Six Rudolph. Uh, this is for Ben. It's perhaps slightly off topic. Uh, I'm also very excited about this question. Um, uh, but uh, Six is a big uh, sci-fi fantasy nerd. What have you found? Uh, where have you found your queer experience right reflected in speculative fiction, even if it wasn't necessarily explicitly queer. Uh, and for this person, it was Xena and honestly, same. <laughs> uh, love that question. I feel like Joan will have uh, input as well. So maybe we can both take a bit of that. Um, I mean, fully am a hobbit. Um, so it's just my lifestyle like that is truly my, you know, like I, yeah, that, that, you know, so Lord of the Rings, I would say for sure, um, was important to me in that way. Um, you know, I mean, Sam and, and Frodo, it like, it doesn't get, you know, I mean, Zena and Gabrielle, Sam and Frodo, like these are like the, you know, couples for all time. Um, you know, speaking of Zena, I'm just going to put a quick plug in because my coworker, um, uh, Lucy, uh, SC Lucier, their album, I think comes out tomorrow. It will be streaming on Spotify. They wrote um, a rock musical inspired by Xena. It's a lost episode of Xena where Xena and Gabrielle's relationship comes to its full and natural cut, you know, sort of uh, conclusion. And they got some amazing Broadway talent to, um, to do to uh, to record some of the songs. So it's called Xena Warrior Warrior Musical, The Lost Scroll, and it's going to be streaming on Spotify tomorrow. So jump into that because it's amazing. Um, and uh, you know, and then sort of Left Hand of Darkness, Ursula K. Le Guin was um, that's a book that is that I read very regularly. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, that's, that that's another one. Joan, how about yours? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, Zena's a, I have so many moments in my life where I'm like, I should have known I was gay sooner. One of them was dressing up as Zena for Halloween as like an eight-year-old. So like, you know, they're there. Uh, but I think, I started thinking about actually fan fiction and fan communities in terms of um, queer representation in sci-fi. Uh, the Galaxians came out of Boston. They're a uh, queer ne a network of queer and fantasy sci-fi fans who have at times, there's, there's chapters that still exist. The Boston one doesn't any longer, but they'd have their own conferences. They would hold their own conference panels at other larger sci-fi conferences. They would um, signal boost and share the work of, of queer and sci-fi authors. Um, and they got together in the late eighties and they were known for a letter writing campaign. Um, when the next generation of Star Trek was coming out asking or demanding a queer character and then Gene Roddenberry died and that didn't happen for a while. Um, or it happened in deep space nine. I don't, I'm not a Trekkie, so please don't, don't be offended by, by me. Um, but that kind of like, you know, if you don't see yourself in something, you make it. And so there's a lot of people out there who are still writing fan fiction about all sorts of things. And it's very queer. Um, and I'm totally outing myself as somebody who sometimes reads fan fiction. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there we, now it's on tape. So that's my... Embrace it. Embrace yeah. it, Joan. <laughs> Joan, we're going we're gonna to talk after this call, Joan, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have two really, really awesome questions in the chat. So I wanna to get to those before we run out of time. We've got about four more minutes. Um, so we have two questions. What is your favorite queer history book for teenagers and kids? 
Uh, and then the second question is, younger queer people are often more focused on queer futures than queer histories. Do you think engaging younger generations is important and how do we do that? So uh, we can start with queer history books for teenagers and kids. I like Michael Bronski's Queer History of the United States. Um, it's very broad, but it starts at the beginning. It starts before the pilgrims landed. Um, mm -hmm. But also full disclosure, I am a fan of Michael Bronski. He works with the History Project as a volunteer sometimes. He's a very well-known queer author and historian here in Boston. Um, yeah, so that's the that's the first one I think of. Um, how about you, Ben? I'm gonna have to pass on this one um, because I've got to say it's not it's not a place that you know in terms of queer history and youth, um, you know I think that that's a place that I that I I don't nothing's coming to mind. So yeah. mm. there's a lot more queer novels for like young adult queer novels are a huge thing now. And that wasn't, again, less than 10 years ago. That wasn't what the landscape was. So there's a lot out there. Um, yeah, graphic novels too, like amazing queer graphic novels. Yeah. For young people. Yeah. yeah. And if you're somewhere where you can't get a hold of queer graphic novels, um, I think you can, if you're a youth, get a, a digital Boston Public Library card. I believe it's also a New York City Public Library card too. Um, and we can find a link to that too. Yeah. Excellent. All right. And last question. Uh, let's talk about engaging younger generations. What a great way to end this conversation. Would you like me to read that question again? Or you're good to go? Um, I think my reaction to that question was futures are important to think about too, though. And I think, um, you know, not not to bash history, the historian, but that, um, you know, thinking about, I mean, maybe the long view of what we're doing now is an interesting thing to do. I think also though, um, and this might be depressing, but I think kids now coming up can imagine a much different future than we could coming up. Um, like I, I already said, I was born before there was a gay rights bill in Massachusetts. Um, marriage equality was the debate when I was a teenager. And like, you know, now things are very different. And I think, um, who knows, maybe they're imagining those futures because they really can. They can imagine all sorts of things that I don't think that we, that would only have been imagination for us not that long ago. Yeah. Um, I. I think it's it's such a good question. I mean, I feel like when I think about some of the ways that question of sort of engaging people with history, it's sort of why do we want to engage people, young people with history? It's about meeting them where they are, which is all of our work. Um, as we are developing sort of our program at the New York Historical Society, we're working with the education team at the New York Historical Society around, they have sort of a week-long immersive curriculum around sort of dem democracy and what, what is required in a democratic um, society. And one of their days is about the role of activism in democracy. And I think that... Um, you know, we're working together to sort of talk about how like our core exhibition will be the place that students who are coming for that week long, you know, seminar will come and they'll, you know, they'll sort of focus in on sort of the, the, the queer liberation movement. Um, so I think, you know, I think for, for us, we're thinking about like, where, where, where are we meeting people, we're meeting them around, creative practices, um, looking at, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we did a program with the Alice Austin House Museum on Staten Island, which is an amazing historic house um, and, you know, home of Alice Austin, who was a 19th century queer uh, photographer, late, early 20th century uh, queer photographer. And, um, 
they have planted a garden of sort of gender fluid botanicals uh, sort of specimens. And so we were sort of engaging people around that and that led to um, a, a series of conversations with uh, exhibition directors and natural history museums about a uh, traveling exhibition on um, gender fluidity and same sex relationships in the biological world. Um, and so we're like in early stages of talking about what that might look like, but that's a place where we're going to be engaging a lot of young people. You know, I mean, natural history museums are places where the primary visitor is a family with young people in it. And sort of, I think about sort of how can we normalize queerness, not just as a human construct, but as a sort of a biological necessity, reality, sort of part of, uh, you know, um, you know, the way that the world evolved to, um, to sort of, uh, to function at its best. And so, you know, I think you just have to, you have to find those places, the histories that maybe we want them to know, um, you know, you, you've, you've just got to be led, you've got to be led by where they are. There's Thank a you. really good podcast oh. on lesbian seagulls, just by the way, Ben, if you haven't Love listened that. to it yet. Thank you. <laughs> on oh, your wrong right. about. <laughs> I will be looking for that for sure. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I could have listened to this conversation for another like three hours, I think. Uh, I have so many questions, but uh, we are unfortunately out of time today. Uh, ben, Joan, thank you. This has been such a phenomenal uh, evening. Uh, thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. and. Um, just wow, what incredible work you're doing. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank, I'm getting a little emotional. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Friends of the Longfellow House, uh, Washington's headquarters, again, for their support and funding the, the 2023 Fall Lecture Series. Uh, please join us again Wednesday, tw November 29th at 6 p.m. for the next Fall Lecture Series event. We'll be learning about illustrated novels as travel souvenirs uh, with uh, Jacqueline Musatio, Professor of Art at Wellesley College, and there's a link in the chat for more information and registration. We'll also be sending out all of the links that were in the chat today, as well as the recording uh, to everyone uh, within the next week. Uh, and I, again, I look forward to watching it over and over again. <laughs> so thank you all so much for joining us. Have a fantastic night. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.